Reuven's mentorship is perhaps his greatest legacy. It's an ongoing one. To this day, when I write about matters of jihadism, I ask myself, would Reuven approve? What would he think? And how would he frame the problem? He died on February 22nd, 2015, at the age of uh, 64, and he's sorely missed. He left behind two children in Baal and Tal with his first wife, Daniela, with whom he was in excellent relations until his final days. He left behind his life partner of 15 years, uh, Linda, um, and two grandchildren, Yuval and Yardin. May his, memory be, uh, may his memory be blessed. I would like to now um, call upon the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Mr. Yaakov Katz, who's going to moderate the session of jihadism, which is going to be a great session with uh, some of the leading young scholars on this uh, issue. Um, and um, along with uh, Mr. Katz, I would invite also our panelists, um, Paul Cruikshank, the editor-in-chief of the CTC Sentinel, um, Mr. Ayman Jawad al-Tamimi um, of uh, the IDC, Yassin Musharbash, an investigative journalist for the Zeit magazine, uh, Clint Watts of the uh, uh, FPRI, uh, among others, and Aaron Zellin of the Washington Institute for Nearest Policy. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Uh, thanks again. I think this will be a great, con uh, a great panel. Global Jihad Divided, Al-Qaeda versus the Islamic State. And it's probably one of the more fascinating topics right now of what's happening in the region, and especially just over the border in Syria. And for many of you who are probably following breaking news, although probably not obs as obsessively as I might be, uh, recent reports just of this morning of attempts by the Syrian military to shoot down Israeli aircraft over the border. But... What I'm always taken in by is the fact that if you, and I spent just a couple weeks ago, uh, a few days in the Golan Heights on vacation in the last few days of the summer, but if you drive along the border today of uh, Israel with Syria, it's kind of, I think, like a mosaic of what's happening inside the region. On the one hand, you could start down on the southern part of the border near, let's say, Hamat Gader, and just drive up along, and you might encounter in the beginning some ISIS guys on the other side of the border. As you drive a little further northwest, you'll encounter some people from Al-Qaeda affiliates of different sorts, and we'll be able to hear about who exactly they might be in a few moments. You drive a little further north, and you'll encounter people from the Syrian military, and then Hezbollah and IRGC, Iranian Revolutionary Guards. And as we look throughout the region today, that's kind of what's happening. That's the story, I think, unfortunately, for better or for worse, of definitely what's happening along Israel's borders, but even in the wider region in places like Iraq and elsewhere. And I think we have quite the lineup today to uh, dive deeper into what's happening in the region and get a closer look at that mosaic of what's taking place throughout the Middle East when it comes to Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the larger terminology of global jihad. We have Paul, who's the editor-in-chief of CTC Sentinel and a terrorism analyst for CNN. Ayman Al-Tamimi, who's a Rubin Fellow at the Center, the Rubin Center for Research and International Affairs at your IDC Herzliya. Yassin, who is the deputy editor at the investigative department at Dezit in Germany. And Clint Watts, who is a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute at the Center for Cyber and Homeland Security at uh, GW, at George Washington University in the US, and Aaron, who is the Richard Burrow Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy in Washington, DC. So before we start our discussion, uh, each of the panelists will have an opportunity of five to seven minutes, I'm told, and your urge to stay within your time frame uh, to give us kind of some opening remarks. So Paul, why don't we start with you right. on the very end? Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Well, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, uh, as Yakov was saying, we've been asked to speak for a maximum uh, of seven minutes. Uh, but that's okay for me because it's uh, six and a half minutes more than I usually get on cable news in the United States. Um, let me start by saying something a little bit provocative, which I hope will stir some debate. Uh, the, the media narrative has been of ISIS dominating 
and al-Qaeda weakening. But I think there are grounds to now argue that ISIS is on a glide path to decline, while al-Qaeda uh, is making a comeback, and perhaps in a very significant way. Now, let me caveat that by saying that the demise of the Islamic State is going to be anything but quick. ISIS is the most well-resourced terrorist group in history, and it's going to fight very fiercely to hold on to territory in Syria and Iraq. Even if, if towns like Mosul and Raqqa are eventually taken back, that will far from spell the end of ISIS as a regional and international threat. But there's no doubt ISIS is weakening. It's running low on funds and foreign fighters, and it's losing the battle of hearts and minds for Muslims around the world because of its brutality and its barbarism, as well as the fact that it's now contracting rather than expanding. There's been a very significant fall off in the number of foreign fighters, including Western extremists, traveling to Syria. And while all the momentum was with ISIS in 2014, it has recently lost ground to al-Qaeda-aligned groups on several fronts, including in Durna, Libya last year, where the group was forced out by pro-al-Qaeda jihadis, in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, where there have been defections away from the so-called Islamic State of Khorasan, and on the western side of Africa, where Boko Haram has been weakening and Mokhtar al Mokhtar's al-Qaeda-aligned group has been strengthening. In Yemen, ISIS has been forced to abandon attempts to upstage the much larger AQAP. And according to what Director Brennan of the CIA just told me a few weeks ago when I interviewed him at CIA headquarters at Langley, AQAP and ISIS are starting to cooperate now on the tactical level uh, in uh, Yemen, a sign that the group um, uh, ISIS there uh, has really abandoned attempts uh, to become the biggest player uh, in town. Al-Qaeda, meanwhile, has been playing what Charles Lister has called the long game, slowly, slowly building up their presence in the Arab and Muslim world. And I'm going to say something, uh, uh, again, provocative here, but in terms of manpower, financial resources, and territory, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates and allies are collectively arguably stronger now than at any time ever, any time ever in their history. And although Ayman al-Zawahiri in a tape released just a few days ago still spoke of the United States as the first priority in the armed jihad today, there is a good deal of evidence the group's focus is at least for the time being overridingly on making gains against its near enemies in the Arab world. The Arab Spring and the chaos and turmoil that ensued in the region has changed everything, everything for al-Qaeda. And to understand that, we need to think back to why al-Qaeda launched the 9-11 attacks uh, 15 uh, years ago. And the fundamental reason was they believed it was the United States that was blocking any hope of advancing their key goal of establishing a hardline Islamist order in the Arab and Muslim world. 9-11 was an attempt to sever U.S. support for quote-unquote un-Islamic regimes. But fast forward 15 years and there's no roadblock anymore. The Syrian civil war and the breakdown in security across the region has provided al-Qaeda opportunities they would have hardly dared imagine just a few years ago. The Arab world is now al-Qaeda's first, second, and third priority. Attacking the West, at least for the time being, has become at best a sideshow and at worst counterproductive. Zawahiri signaled this when early last year he sent Jabal al-Nusri leader Abu Muhammad al-Jalani a letter instructing him not to use Syria, not to use Syria as a base to attack the West. Others in this room may have better information than I do, but I can't think of a, a single significant al-Qaeda plot against the West uh, since 2012. The only exceptions I can think of are the plotting activity, the so-called Khorasan group in Syria in 2014, and the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris in January 2015. But it's far from yet clear what the Khorasan group was plotting, and the Charlie Hebdo attackers appear to have last have had contact with al-Qaeda in Yemen all the way back in 2011. And all this underlines the fact that al-Qaeda's focus is squarely on the Arab world. In their drive to take advantage of the security vacuum, al-Qaeda aligned groups are being guided by two strategic maxims, long held by Ayman al-Zawahiri. The first is the need for the jihad movement to gain the support of the Arab and Muslim masses, and the second is the need to take control of territory to create staging points for future expansion. We see this playing out in Yemen with AQAP's on-again, on off-again seizure of towns and territory in the tribal areas. AQAP has taken advantage of anti-Houthi sentiment to win allies among Sunni tribes and has rebranded itself Anzar al-Sharia to broaden its support base, that play for the maximum possible support. Al-Qaeda-aligned jihadis have also embraced this strategy in Syria. Nusra has built up a proto-emirate in Idlib province. It's focused on winning support and allies on the ground, and it itself just rebranded itself to broaden its support. 
And we see the same strategy play out in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, where al-Qaeda have strengthened their alliance with the Taliban in the hopes of making a comeback in Afghanistan, and where they've been building up a regional affiliate, AQIS, led and staffed by jihadis from the Indian subcontinent. Rather worryingly, the group managed to set up a huge, sprawling training complex south of Kandahar, uh, which the United States was forced to take out in a major counterterrorism raid in October of last year. And putting this all together, I think what we're essentially seeing uh, is a drive by al-Qaeda for sustainable jihad. ISIS, by contrast, raced towards declaring a caliphate, uh, but that was arguably doomed from the start because of their underlying political and economic weakness. Brutal repression uh, will only be able to sustain their caliphate for so long. All this means um, that when we're thinking of global jihad, there are reasons to think that ISIS is the hare and al-Qaeda is the tortoise working to cautiously build up the strength of like-minded jihadis. And let me finish by talking a bit about competition between the two groups. While their ideological differences may not seem too large from the perspective of some of their foot soldiers, the acute dislike between their top leaders means I don't think there's a prospect of a doomsday scenario of them joining forces anytime soon, even if there's some evidence of local cooperation in uh, places such as Yemen, places such as uh, Bangladesh. The worry, of course, is that competition between the two groups may lead them to try to outdo each other by launching attacks on Western targets in an attempt to try and make a play for recruits and resources worldwide. But so far, we haven't really seen al-Qaeda do this, with the one exception uh, of Muqtal bel Muqtas brigade in the Sahara Sahel region with their attacks on uh, hotels popular uh, with Westerners there. And actually, right now, it's ISIS who are behaving like the al-Qaeda of old, ratcheting up their international attack planning particularly in Europe. Uh, but this campaign of terrorism is, masked, is, is designed to mask their growing weakness. If the anti-ISIS coalition can end ISIS's controls of towns like Mosul and Raqqa, not only will that disrupt their plotting, but it will also strike a blow against the legitimacy of their so-called caliphate. While the announcement of the caliphate electrified radical Muslims around the world, its demise could see ISIS lose its luster. As we've been marking the 15th anniversary of 9-11, I think it's worth reflecting on under what conditions al-Qaeda may again prioritize international attack planning. And one can imagine a scenario in which they lose significant ground in places like Syria and Yemen, that they come to the conclusion that things have become blocked again, that they blame the United States, and then they again revert back uh, to global terror. One thing's for sure, with thousands of foreign fighters set to stream out of Syria and Iraq in the coming years, Islamist terrorism is going to be a major global security challenge for at least another generation. We'll have to see which groups these foreign fighters gravitate to in the future, but it's quite possible a significant number of those uh, who've been fighting uh, with ISIS could become the foot soldiers of a reinvigorated Al-Qaeda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. <clears throat> I'm in... You're up. I have a presentation. Uh, once an academic, always an academic, yes. <laughs> Um, do I have a remote as well for the... Uh... Uh, that I don't have. Do we have a remote? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking here, and thanks, Paul, for that opening. A uh, very concise, uh, very broad picture overview. Um, I'm going to focus on one particular angle in this, and is the question of the Islamic State's um, international expansion strategies and how they evolved over time, and particularly in reference to competition with al-Qaeda. Um, so the expansion of the Islamic State on the international level beyond Iraq and Syria in trying to become the leading global jihadi brand uh, to supplant al-Qaeda um, initially took the form of declaring uh, provinces or wilayas uh, <laughs> modeled on the uh, structures that came, have come to exist in Iraq and Syria of multiple Islamic State provinces in a variety of areas like Wilayat Raqqa, uh, Wilayat Halab, that's referring to the Aleppo area, and so on and so forth. And as part of that, they also uh, created uh, provinces designed to break borders, so to speak, like Wilayat al-Furat, which spans the borders of Iraq and Syria. So on the international level, this took a, the initial uh, wave was in November of 2014, in which you had a variety of provinces declared in Yemen, uh, Bilal al-Haramain, that's referring to Saudi Arabia because of the two holy sites of Mecca and Medina, 
Libya, the Sinai, and the Algeria and Algeria. Uh, these then evolved, uh, then subsequent uh, Wilaya declarations were made. Uh, in Khorasan, which is Afghanistan, Pakistan, in January of 2015. Uh, in West Africa, following Boko Haram's Pledge of Allegiance in March of 2015. Um, and uh, 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 finally, uh, the last province declaration actually was in uh, June of 2015. Uh, which was the declaration of the Caucasus province, which is, I think, quite significant. So uh, uh, subsequently after that, although the Islamic State has uh, expanded in the sense of de uh, de declaring its presence and operations in a variety of other countries around the world, like uh, Bangladesh, uh, Tunisia, and the Philippines, which has been mentioned previously, um, it's important to note these aren't declared to be uh, wilayas or actual provinces uh, of the Islamic State, uh, despite the fact, you know, there is the same uh, high quality media streaming from these areas, incorporation into the uh, Islamic State's uh, central media channels. Um, so th ah, the remote doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> ah. Now, the question then, I think, seems to be, well, why, why, why is that the case then? Um, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily the case that when the Islamic State declared the wilayas in the initial stage, uh, these provinces in various places like Yemen uh, or in, in Alge or Algeria, for example, that they expected that um, they would necessarily realize a state model replicating what they'd achieved in Iraq and Syria. Uh, so in Algeria, for example, I think the aim was just to poach uh, Al-Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb affiliates. Um, and that did happen to a certain extent. Uh, but the problem is with that Wilaya model is that um, in the end of the day, it's still presenting oneself to be an actual province. Uh, and considering what had been achieved in Iraq and Syria and with all this relentless advertising and the propaganda uh, of the realization of state governance, or what you would call in Arabic temkin, uh, uh, the, generally speaking on the international stage, that's been a big failure. Um, the main exception, of course, has been in Libya, uh, where the uh, Islamic State's presence in a variety of places originated in good part from securing, uh, securing uh, loyalty of various groups and local affiliates. So, for example, in the Sirt area, which has been the focus of all this international attention because of the coalition's attempt to drive them out, uh, as Aaron Zellens actually noted previously, a lot of that came from the defection of local Ansar Sharia uh, networks in Sirt to the Islamic State. Um, but as mentioned, all this seems, uh, on the international stage, it's really been a big failure to replicate state-like structures. Now in Libya, it's, it's falling apart. Uh, in Yemen, it was, it was hit a lot by internal dissent uh, within the Yemeni affiliates. Um, so I think actually what this has meant is that the Islamic State is trying to evolve beyond the Wilaya model uh, of, uh, uh, and, and the, the conceptions of a state and more towards this idea of uh, just claiming operations in as many countries as possible uh, as part of being this broad international terrorist threat. Um, interestingly, and this is the focus now of some of these slides, um, Internal dissent in the Islamic State uh, argued against all these, uh, declaring all these wilayas on the international stage. Uh, this text, Risale fil Menhaj, which is obtained from Raqqa, um, was written by an internal dissenter in the Islamic State called Abu al Farooq al Masri. And he argued that uh, uh, he, he, he was in consultation with the central leadership. Uh, he disappeared a number of months ago after writing this text. Um, he argued, and this is on, the, on this slide, he argued that the Islamic State uh, uh, shouldn't have declared all these wilayas openly in all these different countries. Uh, he argues, as he mentions in Texas, is bringing them above the level uh, that they actually were. Uh, and really, they should have taken the allegiance pledges secretly. The one exception he does allow for in this, uh, he, he does allow for in this uh, text is Libya. Uh, he says that you know, Libya, Iraq, and Syria have offered these ideal maneuvering spaces and resources uh, for the Islamic State to achieve, uh, uh, the le uh, to achieve level of governance and, and realization of the state model. Uh, in short, the Arabic tem concept of, of temkin. Um, but, uh, and he mentions he advised the Majlis Shura or the Consultation Council of the Islamic State to take this strategy at the time. 
uh, but they didn't listen to him. Um, he also elaborated on this a bit further in another work which I obtained, which was obtained from Raqqa and which I have, uh, which was banned by the Islamic State's authorities in Raqqa called the Political and Organizational Program for the Islamic State. Um, and uh, in this one, he, he also mentions, uh, he gives a list of the external provinces of the Islamic State. Um, uh, he, wrote, he notes it amounts to 16 provinces. Um, it should be noted, actually, that this is a, a slight discrepancy with the number that Islamic State has claimed in its propaganda. For example, in eastern Saudi Arabia, IS has claimed a province in its propaganda called Wilayat al-Bahrain, but it's not listed here, uh, which is an interesting discrepancy. Anyway, the point he makes is that uh, this, uh, again, the same point about not being able to realize Temkin is a significant obstacle uh, for, declaring wilayas, uh, for declaring wilayas on the international level. And uh, he does make an exception for West Africa, but uh, that was based on the fact that Boko Haram controlled territory at the time that they declared allegiance to the Islamic State. Again, so in sum, um, we see the Islamic State on the international level uh, moving, uh, I think, beyond now its conventional models of statehood and the wilayas, and uh, more to presenting itself as just a, cap a striking force that can, that can hit anywhere in, in so many different countries. Uh, so this is a... My, uh, just an aspect I wanted to present on the Islamic State and its international expansion. Um, and really, I think in the grand picture, it has failed to uh, surpass Al-Qaeda as, as the number one global jihadi brand. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Ayman. Yassin. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, I just want to uh, say one quick thing about uh, Raven, who I had the pleasure to meet in 2005 when I was working on my Al-Qaeda book. And one thing that I will not forget is how willing, even eager, Raven was to share information and knowledge that he had gathered. And I found that not only very generous, but also the right way to deal with this task that all of us are working on. Um, the field of global jihadism is huge, and there's enough for all of us to find out about and the more we cooperate, I think, and the more we share, uh, the better uh, we will be at it. And when I was visiting Reuven um, to interview him about uh, the early stages of Al-Qaeda on the Internet, I remember how uh, he told me about the conversations he was having with uh, one of the jihadists online to find out uh, about the way they were thinking. And I think Reuven and I agreed on the fact that jihadists know best about jihadism, in a way. They may be the crooks and the evil guys, um, but it is easier for them to explain their own world uh, than it is for us to find out about it without talking to them. So what I have done in preparation uh, of this little talk is um, I've tried to do what Raven probably would have done. I've spoken to two members of the global jihadist movement who are at the moment no active fighters, but who I believe um, have reason to believe at least are pretty well connected um, here in one of the neighboring states that I shall not name. Um, and I have asked them about their uh, opinion um, of the controversy between the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda um, because I just wanted to get a sense of how would they term it, how would they phrase it, what are the categories that are important to them. So here are two quotes that I have left completely unedited. This is what the first guy had to say. The coming wars and conflicts will make the Mujahideen grow together even more because their aim is the same. I think it is possible that Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State reunite one day, maybe under an entirely different new name, maybe under the IS label. As far as Zawahiri is concerned, people are now harvesting what he and others have sowed, but that's fine. This is about a common mission. If today an IS member and an AQ member were to meet in this room and I could organize that, they would both be my friends and they would be respectful towards one another. And this is what the second guy said. Al-Qaeda has ideological and political problems. The concealing of the death of Mullah Omar for two years, that was a problem. There were people who had given their bay'ah, their pledge of allegiance to him, and they needed to know, they had a right to know. Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State aren't that different. Al-Qaeda simply never had the opportunities that the Islamic State had, for example, in Mosul. There is mutual respect. But there are differences also, as far as the general thinking is concerned. This pertains, for example, to the area of implementation. 
The Islamic State sticks more closely to the words of the text, to the literal. They are less compromising in their interpretations. Al-Qaeda sometimes behaves more like politicians. Of course, it is a problem that Jolani, it uh, uh, pertains to Jabhat al-Nusra at the time, killed ISIS people. In a way, it is what we call a broken bone in Arabic, meaning that it's not easy to you know, get, it, get it joined back together again. Sometimes it feels like Al-Qaeda is almost becoming like Hamas. They are soft on the manhaj. Some things get lost. They give in too much. So I thought this was very interesting because I think what speaks of these quotes is that there is a general desire, if you are a jihadist, if you have made the life decision to be part of the global jihadist, then there is a desire that there be one global jihadist movement, not two competing ones. I think this whole Islamic State versus Al-Qaeda thing is something that many members of the global jihadist movement want to be over one day. Uh, even though they don't deny that there are serious problems at the moment, some of them have to do with uh, persons. I think Zawahiri is considered an obstacle for many uh, uh, who are leaning towards Islamic State. Um, the relation of Al-Qaeda to the Taliban is a problem for many who are leaning towards the Islamic State. The brutality of the Islamic State, on the other hand, is a problem for many who are leaning towards Al-Qaeda. There's an age difference um, that I think is quite, um, quite su substantial. Uh, I know that um, from in, in Jordan, for example, the general rule is the older the guy, the more likely he is to end up with Al-Qaeda. The younger the guy, the more likely he is to end up with the Islamic State. So there's a, a, almost a generational question at play here. On the other hand, we should not forget, and uh, Paul thankfully mentioned the Charlie Hebdo attack already, that for attackers on the ground, for plotters on the ground, these differences may not matter much at all. And um, they seem to be quite happy, uh, as the guys were in Paris at the time, to actually perform, you know, what was really two attacks in one, one claimed by, or in the name of AQAP, and one claimed for the IS, without any of them having any problem with that at all, putting those two organizations in a situation, funnily, where, you know, they didn't react to it. They could have, but they didn't. IQ, uh, AQAP did not say this was not an IS plot, and the IS did not say this was not an AQAP plot. Um, so, uh, I guess that um, the differences that we are seeing at the moment in the eyes of jihadists, who quite generally have a different sense of time, a different time horizon from ours, uh, that these differences are something that they expect can be put behind one day, but maybe, you know, this is, means a generation away from now, certainly not tomorrow or within the next two months. But this is my interpretation of what I've been hearing from these people, and I'll leave it at that and hope that it informs our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yassine. <clears throat> Clint, you're up. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to start off with a question for the crowd. Who here thinks that the death of bin Laden was important for the rise of ISIS? Raise your hand. Do you think that bin Laden was important, that killing bin Laden was important? Did he make a difference? Was he significant enough? Some say no, some say yes. The answer, I did a survey on the day that he was killed. The answer resoundingly was, it doesn't matter. Bin Laden doesn't matter, he's not important. I would tell you that Zawahiri being a very ineffective and disliked manager is the reason that ISIS was more than willing to break away. If I did this conference 10 years ago, everyone would tell me that oaths of, oaths of allegiance bind forever. They will never be broken. I, I heard this. This was in D.C. Once they pledged the ideology of al-Qaeda, they will never break away because that oath, it means so much to them. They're all in this together for the ideology. Over the last three years, there have been more bias broken. People have switched allegiances. You have a fracture right now in Boko Haram. You have a fracture group in Jabhat al-Nusra right now. You have fractures in ISIS. I could probably be come up with two dozen of them. Why didn't we call this Mujahideen 3.0? Why do we call it al-Qaeda or why do we call it ISIS? When I first came into this sort of era of terrorism, it was in the 1990s, and I didn't even know it at the time that it was called al-Qaeda. We were talking about the 1998 embassy bombings, and the military was talking about different actions, the U.S. military at the time. We called them the Mujahideen. That's what we called them. So as analysts and terrorist analysts, if I rewound three years ago and I said, 
we're going to have a conference and we're going to talk about two competing terrorist groups, people would have said, no way, that's not going to happen. Al-Qaeda runs the show. Two years and three months ago, I was on a panel that was called, What is Al-Qaeda's Grand Strategy? And I had to argue for 90 minutes with another analyst who told me that ISIS was nothing. It was a flash in the pan. It was totally going to go away. And six days later, they took Mosul. So I would tell you right now, more than anything, is we are terrible at anticipating what the future is going to look like unless it looks like something we've seen in the past. So we're talking about al-Qaeda versus ISIS right now. And I would tell you that there's already a third thing that has emerged. And we're calling it al-Qaeda and ISIS, and I, that was an excellent point Yassin just made. They don't even know if they're al-Qaeda or ISIS. We spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. talking to al-Qaeda and ISIS because if we can't make sense of all of it, then what do you need us for, right? We're not very important if we can't tell you how all of this is organized. It has never been so disorganized. Speed is amazing. In two years... ISIS has risen and fallen. If I asked anybody in this room, could you tell me the top 10 members of ISIS right now? If you can, I would like to know, because I don't know who they are. Who are the top 10 people in Al-Qaeda right now? In the 1990s, most of the people that were we considered in the U.S. on 9-11 to be Al-Qaeda members didn't even know they were in Al-Qaeda. They thought they were just terrorists leading their own groups. If you go back through some of the interviews, some of the people that were wrapped up, we said, he is the number five man in Al-Qaeda. And number five man would go, I'm in Al-Qaeda? <laughs> totally confused. So we spend a lot of time trying to organize chaos and try and make sense of all of it. But what I would tell you is there is a general theme that occurs. Foreign fighter migrations lead to other conflicts later on. Let's think about it. The Mujahideen, the foreign fighters that went to Afghanistan, they ultimately did what? There were tons of foreign fighters left over. They spawned Al-Qaeda, generation one. I call it the Bruce Springsteen generation of Al-Qaeda. Kind of old, boring now, but we still listen to it from time to time. <laughs> Second generation, the Islamic State. Who was that? Those were the foreign fighters that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan 10 years ago. What did it spawn? The Islamic State. Right now, we have the largest and most diverse foreign fighter migration in the history of the world. Why do we think it will only look like Al-Qaeda or ISIS? I would tell you we're in the era of Jamats and Ansars, and there are dozens of them. And in some places, they'll be called Al-Qaeda, or they'll switch their name, like Nusra did. Why would Nusra, if this was all part of Al-Qaeda's master plan, which everyone tells me was a secret, yet we all know about it in this room somehow. I don't know how we all know about it. If this was part of their master plan, why would they change their name? Why would Jolani feel like he needs to break away from his old Islamic State partners and fight them at one point, and then also have to arrange some sort of passive way to disconnect from Al-Qaeda at another point? We're already entering into a third generation. It's less global. Any extremist group that's out there right now is dumb if they want to go on a globalist agenda. They've watched Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State be crushed by global counterterrorism efforts. Why? Why pursue that agenda anymore? When people say Al-Qaeda to me, to me that's the globalist agenda. So I see a lot of things labeled as Al-Qaeda right now that I don't think are Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but the blend of both. State building, avoid big global conflicts, we'll build up our own steam here and that's because, one, they're rational first and ideological second. They always pursue their own politics. They always try and carve out their own space. And they do what they need to do to survive. And they will change that ideology. They'll morph it rapidly. Think how quickly the ideology of al-Qaeda has changed just in the last 20 years. Just in the last five years, the things the Islamic State has added to. What about sectarianism? So the other thing that I think we've got to look at more than anything moving forward is there are dozens of terrorist groups that are out there around the world right now, and they've followed two models up to date that won't work in the future. Al-Qaeda's model was donor-based. Why was bin Laden the most important terrorist? Because he had money and the others did not. He could resource his operations, he could get them moving. The Islamic State, why did it grow so quickly? Because they built a state and they actually taxed their people. They governed and they had the largest resource base, as Paul said. 
So moving forward, neither of those are going to work. So what are they going to do? They either have to pursue their own efforts to start to pull finances, like Abel Mukhtar, who does black market operations, or maybe they go towards state sponsors, because this is the most sectarian conflict there's ever been. Some places, Al-Qaeda groups will do better. Some places, Islamic State groups will do better. And in other places, we'll have something that's completely different, where we'll have warlords that essentially govern under jihadist states. And why will that be? Because dictators fell, and democracies failed, and the world has watched. So moving forward, I would say Al-Qaeda versus ISIS, I would try to imagine what we've never seen before, which is probably nothing, neither Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. Thank you, Clint. Aaron. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be on a panel that's in honor of Ruven Paz uh, two years in a row now. Um, uh, I think that we owe a lot to his study and background and all he did online in terms of uh, producing a lot of primary sources in the early days. Um, and it definitely influenced me in regards to my own website, Jihadology. Um, in terms of uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, I think I'm going to provide more of a theoretical and structural take on this. Um, I know that that sounds boring, but I think it's important um, uh, that will help provide some historical context as well as maybe uh, could be useful in terms of where things could go in the future in relation to both organizations. Um, and while we focus on what these groups specifically do, in many ways, a lot of what happens is also because of external factors. Um, and I think we miss this sometimes. Um, so I have three, I think there's one way we can look at this, um, is when have we seen the biggest growth in jihadi activism historically? Um, and I think that there are three times. One is foreign fighter mobilizations, which Clint mentioned, which I agree with fully. Another is certain government policies in relation to jihadi activity in their own countries in terms of the openness to the ability to recruit. Um, and then lastly is related to prison policies. So in terms of foreign fighter mobilization, if we look at Bosnia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, which group was there when the foreign fighter mobilization really was important? In the 1990s in Bosnia, Al-Qaeda was well-placed. In Afghanistan in the late 90s, Al-Qaeda was well-placed. In Iraq last decade, Zarqawi's network was well-placed. And in Syria, um, the Islamic State of Iraq's network was well-placed. So that in many ways helped explain why certain groups might have been stronger than others in those particular locations. So. When's the next big foreign fighter mobilization? I'm not going to tell you which country, but whichever country it is and whichever network is placed there is likely the one to take the most advantage of it. Another indicator, I think, is also state sponsorship in relation to foreign fighter mobilization. We had Saudi Arabia and Pakistan in the 1980s. Um, we had Pakistan in the 1990s and whatever they're still doing. We had Syria last decade in relation to the Iraq war. And currently we have Turkey and what's going on in Syria. So if there is another foreign fighter mobilization, we should be looking at if there is a country next door that has a particular policy and why that might be beneficial to them, that could help also explain why a particular group might uh, win over the other. And in terms of what's going on now, I think with Turkey, uh, which is still relevant, that will for sure be beneficial to um, uh, the group formerly known as Jabhat al-Nusra. In terms of government policy and jihadi activities, if you look historically, um, the Egyptians pretty much let jihadis run free in the 1970s. The Saudis and Yemenis pretty much let jihadis do whatever they wanted in the 80s and 90s. The Europeans pretty much did it whatever, uh, didn't do anything uh, and allowed jihadis to openly proselytize and so on and so forth. Groups like al Muhajirun, Sharif of Belgium and all their splinter branches in the 90s as well as last decade. Um, and then a more recent example is Tunisia after the revolution from 2011 to 2013. This in many ways explains why, you know, in the 80s and 90s we saw so many Egyptians, Saudis and Yemenis involved. Why, you know, Syria is in many ways a logical conclusion of why so many Europeans have been involved. And then of course Tunisians as well more recently also. Um, 
And then the and then the last one uh, is prison policy. Who is returning to the battlefield? Who is being let out of prisons? And who's getting more strength? You know, in Egypt historically, more people would get back onto the field, and as a result, that would once again uh, reinvigorate the movement. Um, uh, you know, more recently with Guantanamo Bay, while obviously I don't contone torture. I do think that a lot of individuals that were actually arrested were bona fide terrorists that should have been put to trial. They shouldn't just be released and put back into the wild. And as we've seen, there's been huge recidivism more recently with a lot of the cases of individuals going back to Syria and joining up with the groups. And of course, many of them are aligned with Al Qaeda, and as a result, that's been to their own benefit. Um, in terms of Europe, you know, part of this is more related to soft penalties. You don't put a jihadi in jail for six months. The guy's not going to change. Um, I'm more uh, in line with the U.S. policy where you throw away the keys, but I know that that might not necessarily go over well in every European country. Um, and then also in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings, you saw a bunch of prison amnesties just letting these jihadis free just because, you know, it felt good during the revolution because, you know, the previous guy was a dictator. Yeah, he might have been a dictator, but there are still terrorists running around in their countries. Um, and some of the benefits of this happened in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Libya, um, and then in Syria as well. And then another note about prison policy um, is also that, you know, the whole uh, so-called dynamic of jihadi universities in that putting a bunch of jihadists together in a prison also is a recipe for disaster because it provides an opportunity for people to meet each other, organize, um, and expand their Rolodexes. So we saw this with Yemen, and then in 2006 they all left prison, and that helped create AQAP. We saw this in Iraq with Camp Bukha. We all know the story that's been written a million times in the media now in terms of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and all of the people he was speaking with um, in the reemergence of the Islamic State. Um, and then in the case of Tunisia as well, based off of my own research, um, all the way going back to 2006, five years before the Arab uprisings, that guys were planning on what they were going to do after they were released from prison. And it's no surprise that they're able to, you know, operate actively and openly and being very successful in it because they had a plan and they stuck to it. It also, you know, was helpful that the government provided the freedom, which goes back to the second point. So with all that said, um, if we're looking to the future, where where is the future of foreign fi fighter mobilization going to be and who's, which group's going to benefit, which state sponsor is going to select a particular group in a particular location that's near this foreign fighter mobilization? Which governments are going to allow jihadis to operate openly? Is it going to be a country where the network is more pro-Al-Qaeda, pro-ISIS? Or is it going to be just some local jihadis that haven't really made a decision or want to do their own thing, as Clint has alluded to? And also, um, what people are going to be coming out of prison soon? Are they going to be people that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or freelancers? Um, and who's planning something now inside of prisons? Um, I would definitely worry about countries like Egypt, countries like Algeria, uh, certain European countries. Um, uh, so I'll just leave it that for now, and I look forward to the discussion. So thank you. Okay, so I think there's uh, a lot to talk about here, and we all touched upon a lot of different issues, and it seems that uh, definitely one of them is uh, looking to the future and trying to predict what might happen in the coming years as this divide and the division between Al-Qaeda and IS continues to take form, and what exactly will be born out of what's happening. I think, Clint, maybe we'll just start with you, because you touched upon that. So what's next? What you've spoken, uh, you've spoken and written about, I mean, possibly the establishment or the formation of a third entity that could come out of uh, the division and the split between Al Qaeda and IS. What would that look like? Beyond, uh, would it be reunification? Would it be something else? If you had to I, predict, I don't even think it'll be an entity. I, I think it will be a third paradigm, basically, which will be series of groups that that have two or three things that they do. One, they have their own financing that they can bring by either building some sort of emirate, a small state, um, which they can operate. 
or they have a mega donor of some sort which we've seen this kind of crop up in Libya. There's lots of little groups, militias running around that have pulled in their own donor base. Or three, you have state sponsors, particularly around the sectarian issue, which come in on the Sunni or Shia side, which they see these extremist groups as particularly useful. And if, I, if you look back to the 1990s, that's, that was very common, especially here uh, in, in, with the uh, Palestinian groups. The other thing is there's no reason to focus on big global attacks unless you have a couple things happening to you. One, you need to reinvigorate your brand. Let's say your group is on the brink of desolation. One thing you can do is elevate your game by doing a big global attack or a regional attack, which brings attention to yourself. So that sometimes can be a reason why you start to pursue that global agenda. Beyond that, I think bin Laden would tell you, if you look at the bin Laden documents from Abbottabad, the last thing you want is a series of drones hovering over your head. It is, look at the Islamic State's rise all the way up to when coalition airstrikes started and then how quickly it's come back down again. Same thing with Nusra right now. Part of the reason Nusra has tried this rebranding effort is to sidestep the armed use of military force and the U.S., which is I'm not part of al-Qaeda, so you shouldn't be able to target me anymore, right? That's a little bit what they're trying to do. So they're trying to push off that global agenda. The other part is about winning local support. And there's a couple of competing approaches, and we, uh, a lot of us were talking about it uh, last night and this morning, which is al-Qaeda has always tried to win over local support and done it very slowly, and they're always trying to be sneaky. They're so sneaky and smart. But somehow, when they're sneaky and smart, they still lose their way with the local populace or become they have to compromise their own ideology to win over that local support. The Islamic State's gone the reverse route, which is we don't really care what the local populace thinks. We'll just beat them into submission through violence, and then they'll just do what we want. And so over time, I think there's, there's becoming this nexus between the global agenda and winning local support. That's really what Nusra has had to decide. And then the method by which you advance your ideology. And I think that's what we'll see moving forward is it'll be more local. There'll be lots of regional and local dynamics. There'll be connections to both al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. I don't know as a... a a 20 to 24 year old between North Africa and Southeast Asia, how you don't have a connection to the Islamic State at this point. There's tens of thousands of foreign fighters out there. We used to make a big fuss of this in Washington after 2002. We'd say he's connected to Al Qaeda. Well, good grief. Every 20 year old man in North Africa and the Middle East is connected to Al Qaeda or the Islamic State. So I, I think we're going to see a much more local phenomenon where people try and carve out their space, build up their resources. And what we see in the future will look more like the 1990s, which is a very distributed terrorism landscape over the horizon. Paul, I want to go back to you for a moment, uh, just following up on that. So 9-11, uh, 15 years ago, still kind of at least for Americans, and I think largely for the Western world, perceived as being you know, the most devastating and the largest terrorist attack and really one that struck a blow at the Western way of life and world. And even with what ISIS has done throughout the region, it's very isolated to hear, yes, some stuff that's gone, you know, attacks that have succeeded throughout Europe, but you know, not, nothing major, at least in America so far. Um, when you think about that and you, and you look to the future, you spoke about the long game, right? So is, is Al-Qaeda building up towards something, or are we looking a, a different, separate route, or is it going to be also how do you see them playing together with ISIS? Al-Qaeda doesn't care about the United States. It's never cared about the United States. The only reason it ever attacked the United States uh, was, as Clint was saying, to sort of unify jihadi ranks uh, around something that was popular, this sort of anti-Americanism rising um, in, in, in the region, but also much more crucially because they saw uh, the United States as blocking their dream of restoring, quote-unquote, true Islam to the Arab world. And for Al-Qaeda, it's really the Arab world. It's always been about the Arab world, not so much about Pakistan, Afghanistan, Chechnya, and so on, particularly for Zawahiri. It's about Egypt and the Arab world. And right now, as I was sort of mentioning in my presentation, um, they have huge opportunities. Um, and uh, they're going to make hay while the sun is shining uh, right now across uh, the region. So why would they uh, try to launch international uh, attacks uh, at the moment? I, I don't think there's much evidence that they've been trying to hit 
uh, the United States again. It's not because they don't have the capability to do it. I think they perhaps have more capability than ever before to launch the United States. It's just they're not prioritizing uh, that uh, for the moment. With, with, with ISIS, it's almost sort of like the opposite, though. They, as they are losing uh, ground, are ratcheting up uh, international terror for exactly the same reasons that al-Qaeda did it uh, 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 initially. To unify because... ranks. Sorry? To, to unify the To the unify fighters. ranks because things are becoming blocked again. They're blaming the United States. It's the far en enemy which has spoiled everything uh, for them uh, in Syria and Iraq. So I think we can ex expect ISIS uh, to ratchet up those attack plots, uh, firstly against Europe, but also they want to get something through uh, against uh, the United States. Al-Qaeda managed it. They want to do it. Uh, it's going to be really difficult for them to do it because uh, hardly any Americans have joined uh, the group. Uh, but over time, they're going to try and infiltrate operatives into the United States. And this is a group which is the, the, the richest, best resourced uh, group uh, in history. It's only um, dedicated a fraction of its resources so far to international uh, attack planning. Um, they can do a, a lot more diabolical things, as the CIA director was just mentioning to me when I was with him very recently uh, at their headquarters at, at Langley. And so I think um, that we, we need to sort of um, to, 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 to expect them uh, to try and get operatives uh, into uh, the United States to try to launch something uh, major there. Uh, it, it would only require just a, a, a few people that, that have that managed to get in uh, to Syria and Iraq who've got this sort of bomb-making training uh, to get in uh, to the United States to do that. The, the U.S. is better prepared than ever before, uh, but they're now up against the, the, the most powerful terrorist group uh, in history. So, you know, I'm afraid we're going to have to fasten our seatbelts. Okay, that, that's exciting. Uh, I'm at, um, I wanted to, uh, to go back to you. So when you look at, though, Al-Qaeda, what do you think their strategy is for the time being? If this is where ISIS is headed, as Paul says, Al-Qaeda is doing what then? Uh, I would uh, reiterate the point about a locally focused uh, strategy. I mean, particularly you see it in, in Syria. I think you see Al-Qaeda investing itself very heavily in the idea that something's good is going to turn out of Sy from Syria in terms of uh, building an Islamic emirate. And as the Wahiri himself says, is as kind of a stepping stone to reviving the caliphate. So, I mean, you know, as has as been made... The point has been made many times before that it is the, still the same end goal uh, of envisioning uh, of envisioning a global Islamic system. When you come to IS and Al Qaeda, it's still the same end goal, uh, and this idea of uh, reviving the the caliphate. Now, in terms of whether that works out in Syria or not, I don't think it it will because you know there's still this obstacle of the U.S. Uh, launching drone strikes and not really considering Jebhat Fetter Sham's rebranding as really much of a difference from from Al-Qaeda and past, but uh, strategically, as, as Paul said, this is where it's going. It's very much Arab world focused, um, particularly in Syria, a locally focused thing of embedding uh, deeply within the Syrian insurgency and trying to exploit that as a means to develop an Islamic emirate. Aaron, uh, just going back to you, why do you think it is, and maybe if this is too much of an insular Israeli question, but uh, you'll forgive me. Um, you know, we, we, we tend to look and we think the world revolves around us here in Israel. And so, but uh, it, it doesn't apparently. But um, we have all these different competing terrorist groups along our borders. We have, you know, ISIS, Al Nusra, and, and, and different groups along the northern border with Syria, different ISIS affiliates, and let's say in, in the Sinai. Uh, there's been some activity ar around Israel's borders, but we haven't seen a real concerted effort to attack Israel in a big way so far. And we're right here. We're just along the border. We're the big enemy. So you've all kind of said, well, they're very focused inside right now in, in unifying ranks and strengthening, you know, uh, getting their fighters focused on where they need to be. But do you think that will change at some point? Will, will, the, will the focus shift to us? Uh, I mean, it's, it's certainly possible. Um, I think probably... Um, more so maybe for Iran and their proxy network, because I think that that's more of a shorter to medium term um, interest of theirs. Whereas I think both Al Qaeda and the Islamic State see Israel as more of a longer term issue that they need to unify the ranks in the local 
um, you know, Arab world or the particular country that they're operating in because they feel that if they're not strong enough and they do something against Israel, they'll just be smashed in two seconds, which is probably a good calculation, um, as has been seen by, you know, groups in Gaza or the Sinai or even some rockets maybe going over in uh, southern Syria. So I think part of it is more related to their own calculation and possibly even the deterrence of the Israeli state against these groups and their understanding of how Israel operates and that Israel's not necessarily uh, has the same types of policies or calculations as Europe and the United States does vis-a-vis -vis, uh, jihadis. Um, so I would say in that regard that uh, – I would be more worried about Hezbollah and the various Shia militia networks that have been built up in the Syrian conflict is more of a concern um, in the short to medium term than the Sunni Arab jihadists. Right. Um, Yassin, you, I read a story recently about how you had some hand in predicting the rise of ISIS. And you wrote that in 2016, well, this is at least what the story you know, credited you with. So uh, you spoke about how the sixth stage would come, and that's wow. 2016. And now we're entering what I think you refer to as the seventh stage of what you refer to as the definitive victory for the terrorists. And I quote, because the rest of the world will be so beaten down by the one and a half billion Muslims and the caliphate will undoubtedly succeed. So. Are we in that seventh stage? Doesn't seem 100%, but w w what's your prediction well, with those stages? First of all, thank you very much to give me the opportunity to clean something up in front of an audience about this article that I wrote in 2005. Um, it is entirely based on the research of a Jordanian researcher, Fuad Hussein, who I'm quoting extensively in that text. Um, the text was called Al-Qaeda's Agenda 2020. What is it that they really want? And Fuad Hussein had done several interviews with high-ranking al-Qaeda members, among them Saif al-Adil at the time, serious guys, um, and had collated from what he had gotten back in response um, a seven-stage model, um, which reflected what he thought was the best way to render their thinking, uh, their strategic long-term thinking. Um, and it is, looking back in hindsight, I have to admit that an intriguing model that... Um, that came out of this effort by Fuad Hussein. I cannot, I cannot stress this enough because this article leads a life of its own. And uh, it's, I mean, just half a year ago, it was reprinted in the British press under my name, you know, as my research, which it never was, completely misunderstood and bent out of form. And it said that it was recent, you know, it's 10 years old. And so, so, but your, so your prediction though? So my prediction is this, or what I would say is this. I think the first four stages, probably the first five stages are, are pretty accurate. Um, and they describe a best-case scenario that in a lot of ways has come true. And I think the last two or three stages that we're looking at are complete crap. You know, because now we're talking about world domination and the establishment of the caliphate all, all across the world and the annihilation of all unbelievers. And that's not going to happen. And we all know that. And they know it too. You know? So we are, now, we are now at the point where this attempt to describe their strategy um, is... You know, is at the end of being realistic and starts being fantastic. You know, um, that said, that doesn't mean that they don't think in these terms. And again, uh, I'm grateful to get you know an opportunity to just briefly say something about the way of thinking that jihadists have. It is different from our way of thinking. We cannot stress that enough. They have a different time frame in mind, and they also think about targets entirely differently of us. When we talk about military planning or political planning, we have a time horizon of three, four, five years, perhaps 10 years. They talk about centuries, and they actually mean it. Um, and so when they say that, you know, it doesn't matter if we lose Mosul and Raqqa, the caliphate will prevail. They don't mean it will prevail in 2018 in some godforsaken corner of Libya. What they mean is that it'll be around in 2050, but Israel perhaps won't. So they have a different time horizon, and we have to understand that if you read their text. So I want, I want to shift maybe in the, in the time that we have left uh, to think about what, what, what can the world be doing, or what should the world maybe be doing differently? So Paul, maybe, you know, when we think about what's happening now, there are, there are possibly on the road to defeat in places like Syria. Uh, we see with the ceasefire that doesn't seem to be holding too well, but is there, is there something that the world can do possibly differently uh, in terms of 
defeating ISIS? Um, well, they need to defeat ISIS and quickly um, because this is taking a long time. And I, 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 I'm very skeptical that Mosul and Raqqa are going to be liberated uh, this year. I mean, it's going to be fierce, the fighting there. Um, and, and, you know, it may sort of be a kind of an, another sort of Stalingrad to some extent uh, that we're going to see uh, in Mosul. But, um, but it's absolutely critical to, to destroy ISIS or, or, or defeat it to, to end its territorial uh, control because that is absolutely key to its legitimacy. That's what electrified uh, radical Muslims around uh, the world. And if, if they are pushed out of their, these areas, then um, these people who are attracted to ISIS aren't going to believe that God is sort of behind their every move anymore. And, and that's going to be very, very deflating uh, for this uh, in, entire movement. So there's, it, it's absolutely critical uh, to defeat them territorially in Syria and Iraq and to do that fast. Um, they're obviously, you know, it's very, very difficult to accomplish because of all the complexities uh, there. Um, and, you know, I think we all need to ask the question, is the international community, our Western governments, countries, European nations uh, doing enough um, given the scale of the threat? I mean, we, you know, various European countries just have a few uh, fighter uh, jets and, 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 and bombing aircraft um, um, involved in this. And this is not a very intense effort yet from uh, the Europeans, given the scale uh, of the threat uh, uh, that we have. So I think one of the questions is, you know, can we be doing more uh, to accelerate the uh, demise of ISIS? I think, I, I, let me just talk a little bit about, you mentioned the sort of the, the, the peace deal, um, the, 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 well, the ceasefire, let us say, the ceasefire that has now come into place uh, in, in Syria. We don't use the term peace deal yes. so easily. Yes. Uh, yeah. and, and there's this deal where the Russians and the Americans are now going to cooperate um, against Nusra and ISIS and so on and so forward. And um, I think that that, that that is quite precarious um, because um, on the ground, all the evidence is um, that... that uh, people are reacting to this as the United States essentially taking the side uh, of the uh, Assad regime. Um, and the, the next time the Russians or the Syrians bomb a hospital, uh, who are they going to blame? I mean, the, the United States is going to be tarnished uh, with this. And, and for the future Mohammed Atas of this world, um, that kind of, that, that, those kind of images uh, can, can really start to have a, a very, very big impact. So I think while there may be sort of tactical reasons the United States is doing this now in Syria, this cooperation with the Russians, I think there's a real danger uh, that there could be a terrorist blowback against the United States, that this could help the uh, al-Qaeda recruitment messaging. So maybe turn to Clint and Aaron here, the two guys who sit in Washington. Um, so Clint, maybe you go first. What can Washington do differently? Uh, the first thing they could do, which they will never do, is figure out what they want. I, so... <laughs> Americans, by and large, just don't want anything bad to happen. That's all they care about. I, they just react to news stories. They really don't have any idea what they want in the Middle East or with terrorism. They just, it is literally a reaction of nothing bad should ever happen. And when it does, we need to fire somebody. Let's fire somebody. And that's it. And it will go away within 30 days and there'll be another crisis. Uh, so it comes down to you've got four options, really. Democracies, dictators, caliphate, or warlords. That's the governance solution, you know, uh, throughout a lot of these areas where terrorists are operating. And so we, we always said we didn't like dictators, so we let them fall after the Arab Spring. And then we were all about democracy, and we, I was laughing with these guys. As soon as we have an election, the, the U.S. is out. Like, as soon as, a, you know, a people vote, we just go, there you go, it's all going to work out. You guys voted, and we leave. Then we don't like caliphates, because that supports terrorism. And then warlords, eh, we don't like that so much either. So Americans cannot descend on what they really want to pursue in their foreign policy from a, from a Western perspective. And I don't think Europe is that much better. Um, and so I think over the horizon, it will just be a continued strategy from the West of, how do we make this problem go away as fast as possible so we can worry about another problem that we want to go away as fast as possible? And I mean that with complete but, seriousness. But Aaron, it, could that potentially lead to increased military engagement, more action coming out of Washington, troops on the boots on the ground, and in a, in a bigger way than what we're seeing right now? I don't think that there's much appetite in the United States for anything along the lines of 2003 Iraq or even 2001 Afghanistan. So. 
I think it'll be more continued special operations, working through partners, trying to implement lessons learned from past successes, trying to further more of these sort of softer approaches through CV or whether whatever the next administration comes up with their own acronym, um, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, though the caveat is, you know, if Trump wins the election, I think nobody has any idea what will happen. So, but with Hillary Clinton, I think that her policies would probably be relatively similar to Obama's, though maybe a bit more blunt, um, and forceful, and maybe reassuring the allies a bit more. Um, so, I think that it's likely to see a lot of the same that we have been seeing. But I would suggest that you know, based off of the construct I was just uh, talking about that we can learn lessons from why there were so many jihadis that joined up in the first place under certain circumstances. We need to prevent these types of things. Instead of waiting until 2014 to do something, we should have been doing something in early 2012 about foreign fighters. That's a reality. But the government didn't want to do it, and of course they waited until there were already 20 to 30,000 new jihadis joining up. So that's one of the issues too, is that we wait till the last minute to do something. And I would argue we need to do it right off the bat, but I, I can't say I have the What moment. should be done about the foreign fighters? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, many of them are probably not gonna return home just because they know that they'll be arrested. So they'll end up going to the next conflict or staying in Iraq and Syria. So part of it is solving the problem of Iraq and Syria, though I'm unsure anybody in the West truly wants to do that. Yassine, uh, Hillary Clinton, so Aaron mentioned uh, Clinton-Trump. Uh, Clinton gave an interview to Israeli television a few days ago last week where she uh, spoke about and she said that ISIS, if I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but ISIS is hoping for a Trump victory. So you were talking to some of your friends online. Um, what do you think they're really hoping for out of the U.S. election? Well, I mean... I think they'll be happy either way. This time they, they don't have much to lose because Clinton would probably mean more of the same, which has kind of worked out for them. And Trump, I agree with Aaron there, you know, nobody knows what it means, but it's potentially good for them because they like chaos. They like war. They want the US to intervene. They want even boots on the ground. I mean, why did they kill James Foley and, and these other people? Why did they do it? It was a trap. They wanted the US to invade. They want, or not to invade because it didn't invade, but to become more active involved and they want the same thing for the European powers to get involved so they are happy whenever the West comes they're happy um, with Trump's there's a the good chance that we'll see more of that probably but nobody knows um, let me say one thing about Europe though because I think that or the thinking in Europe seems to be in a lot of places um, that we are noticing that America is not all that keen anymore to even try and fix the Middle East for the rest of the world um, you, you Americans have become less interested. Uh, we have noticed that. Um, and we are starting to think about how you know, we can, because we have to take your place in that regard. And it's something that we're not used to. It's something that we're not good at. It's something that we also haven't figured out how to do it. But I think there's a, there's a sense of readiness among some European states to play a larger role here. Turkey is going to be one of those players. Some EU states are going to be some of those players who will take some sort of responsibility because this is our neighborhood. For the first time, these people are really, really close. What does that mean, more of responsibility, though? Well, I mean, it means more actively trying to secure borders, for example, which is, you know, an immediate concern for us. Um, and that pertains to foreign fighters flow back as much as it does to refugees. Um, that, you know, may be a cause of concern as well. Uh, it also means propping up, you know, neighbors, uh, neighboring states like Jordan, Lebanon, you know, to, to kind of condemn the conflict as much as possible. I think this is, this is one of the roles that Europeans, are, are, you know, see as something that they, they will have to do. Right. Ayman, when you look at Syria right now uh, and you see that possibly what's happening there and also Iraq, if, if they were to be defeated, what would fill that vacuum? You mean uh, Islamic State or yes. all of them? Islamic State. Um, the Islamic State I'd see going, you know, uh, uh, maybe reverting to its, uh, its uh, old models of, you know, Amaliyat al Amni, as they call them, or security operations. Yeah. <laughs> or um, you know, um, 
maybe they, for example in Mosul, you know, they might lose the territory, but uh, who's to say that they wouldn't go back to uh, the old model in Mosul, which was extorting businesses, uh, being there, but no one quite openly acknowledging it, and still being able to extract a lot of money out of that. Uh, which is why even when they initially expanded into Syria, they had plenty of uh, financial resources at their disposal, uh, you know, to engage in things like dower activities and uh, uh, and, uh, and outreach to local population as part of building their presence uh, uh, in Syria. Um, now, granted, I think circumstances are going to be slightly different from previously. I mean, like, you know, when we look at Syria, we have to remember that uh, there wasn't an open war between Islamic State and all the other rebel factions in Syria until several months after the Islamic State had been building its presence inside rebel-held areas, such that it had the means to develop a center of power uh, within Syria, namely around Raqqa. Uh, this time round, no one's going to say, let's tolerate the Islamic State's presence among us because they, you know, let's say they help us fight the regime. That's just, uh, you know, that that that's completely... That's something of a past era now. So, you know, it's not the end of the Islamic State by any means, but, um, you know, certainly a weaker entity and, uh, you know, not an exact replica of, of what's happened in, you know, 2012, 2013 and 2014. So, Paul, if I asked you if uh, a year from now at the next ICT conference, will we be sitting on stage having a panel with the title of Global Jihad Divided? Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, there's still going to be division between um, Al-Qaeda and um, ISIS because uh, the, the, the leaders just really, I mean, they don't get on. And there's a war of words and it's sort of fed on itself. So I think I, I agree that this is going to take another generation before you may again see some unifying. I think, unfortunately, in a year, the sort of media perception, the popular perception is going to be um, that ISIS is a bigger threat because we're going to see maybe um, uh, some attacks uh, in Europe uh, in, in the coming year. I think all the intelligence is pointing towards them uh, ratcheting up their, their international attack planning, and they're really just going through the gears. I mean, they, they, you know, if they're five gears, they're maybe in gear two or three right now in terms of what they're capable of. So I think that media public perception is going to be of a worsening uh, terrorist threat just at the same time when they're, they're losing more and more ground in, in Syria and Iraq. I, I, I don't think uh, that's going to happen particularly quickly, though. I think there's some people who are very optimistic, and some of us even disagree about this, but, but some people optimistic thinking, you know, it'll be over by Christmas. Um, I fear that um, we'll be all back here next year, and m the battle for Mosul may still be ongoing. The battle for Raqqa may not have begun. Um, it, it just, you know, the, the complexity in, in, in Iraq is, is extraordinary. Um, the Iraqi security f forces are just exhausted. Um, and, and this is a group that, it, that, that is expert at, at using snipers, IEDs, um, at, at exploiting differences, at exploiting Sunni grievances. And, and until you can start to solve some of the politics uh, in, in Syria and Iraq, um, it's just going to be um, an, an, a, a, a very painful reality for, for quite a lot longer. Yeah, yes, see. Um, I, I largely agree with Paul, but I, there's one thing that, that I find sometimes slips our attention. When we talk about the question of whether ISIS is a big threat or not, we tend to think um, of this in terms of terror attacks elsewhere. And we tend to forget that there's millions of people at this moment living under ISIS rule which in and of itself is a threat, namely to these people. I mean, we are talking about at least one million Syrian and Iraqi children who for the past two years have been exposed to extreme measures you know, of, of brainwashing, of, of, of living under conditions that nobody would want their child to live under. So we should not only look at this as a terrorist phenomenon and people plotting attacks elsewhere. They are governing, they are ruling, and they are uh, they're oppressing people. So. Some people are already thinking, I believe at least, in military circles mainly, maybe it's not such a bad thing to leave Mosul for them because then at least we know where they are. They won't be elsewhere. You know, they, they'll be kind of, we can cut them off and, and they'll have their little zoo for jihadists and, and you know, that's fine for us. Yeah, it's fine for us, but not for the people living in Mosul. Mosul is a big city. There's lots of civilians there and I think they have the right to be liberated. Right. 
Um, Clint, just quickly, I, you know, 10 years ago, I remember I was at a briefing that I was the military reporter, and I was a briefing with Israel's chief of staff, Dan Khalutz, and this was pre-Second Lebanon War. So then we were talking about uh, Al-Qaeda, and he said, oh, you know, if you ask my mother, for example, what Al-Qaeda is, it would be some guy with a turban riding a horse out in some desert somewhere. And that's clearly changed, obviously, and definitely from Israel's perception as well and Israel's perspective, but do you think there's anything that Israel should be doing in a more proactive way? You know, we're, we're more in the hunkering down position, building stronger defenses, bigger walls, barriers along our borders to protect ourselves, but is there something we should be doing differently in the region to try to contribute or help to bringing stability to the neighbors? I, I think one of the things that Israel can definitely do for all their counterterrorism partners is show, and which has definitely been the case for me coming from the U.S., which are what are effective techniques versus ineffective techniques in counterterrorism. In the U.S., we like to spend wildly and crazily and try everything all at once. That's our counterterrorism approach. And I think what Israel can do, not, not only in terms of like defending yourself, but is help the U.S. not make missteps or the West not make missteps in a region where we are very good at misstepping. And so I, I think part of it is giving us that sort of experience, that sort of nuance about how do we move forward in what is, I think, the most dynamic jihadi landscape that has ever been. And, and I think the skills and, and the ways you can build connections will be the greatest benefit to you over the longer run, too, in terms of how do you help us shape how we understand what's going on in the region. Because we basically like to do it over the internet from North America. That seems to be how we try and perceive the world. And I, I think being a, a, a good partner will also return benefits to Israel as well. Okay. I want to thank uh, all the panel participants and uh, Boaz Ganor and ICT, IDC, of course. Thank you very much. <laughs>